The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one. So, yeah, you know, you, you wonder, okay, you know, you're a science fiction writer, you're like interested in design, uh, you know, what can you do to affect the future? Why don't you just go out and build something? This is Bruce Sterling. He's one of the founders with William Gibson of the cyberpunk movement in science fiction. And I'm Patrick Coleman, and this is Into the Impossible, a podcast of stories, ideas, and speculations from the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. Now, Bruce is one of the big figures in contemporary science fiction, a longtime contributor to Wired Magazine, among others, and a very turned-on, intellectually voracious, interesting dude. His writing has often anticipated the cultural effects of major technological change. In his novel The Artificial Kid, the protagonist is constantly filming himself with what are essentially drone cameras as he gets into street fights and then becomes a celebrity selling that footage something that doesn't sound too far off from where we are today. But that was written in 1980, around the time that the Walkman hit the scene, or affordable VCRs, or when the Alan Parsons Project had a hit with this song. What you might not know about Bruce is that he's also one of the most interesting design theorists working today. And not just on industrial design, which is the building of clocks and smartphones and mass-produced furniture. He works more in the realm of what's known as design fiction. It's a kind of speculative design. And if both of those terms make you go, huh, we've got you. Speculative design isn't concerned so much with making a good, practical, functional, sellable product. Instead, it's oriented toward answering the question that Sheldon Brown, director of the Clark Center, posed in a recent conversation. How fields such as design, art, science fiction, and technology invention uh, interacted with each other in shaping our imaginations to allow us to see possible paths that we might head out on. Sometimes speculative design is called critical design, but the key thing is that it is deliberately not industrial design. Bruce Sterling points to one book in particular for explaining what speculative design is and how to do it. If you think you might be interested in speculative design, design fiction, critical design, this is the book you want to read first and probably last. This is Speculative Everything by Anthony Dunn and Fiona Raby. And Fiona Raby was here when you uh, opened your speculative design uh, major, so that's a sign you're being blessed by the great dame of critical design. And this book is, I don't know, three or four years old now, maybe even older, but there's never been a better book written on the subject. Dunn and Raby included a list in their book, in two columns, with the things industrial design does on the left and the things speculative design does on the right. Here are a few things from that list to help clarify the picture. Industrial design is affirmative, while speculative design is critical. Industrial design focuses on problem solving. Speculative design focuses on problem finding. There's design as process versus design as medium. Provides answers versus asking questions in the service of industry versus in the service of society, for how the world is against for how the world could be. Design fiction is a subset of speculative design. It's a practice that, as Bruce and others have defined it, involves the deliberate use of diegetic prototypes to suspend disbelief about change. Design fiction is not a form of fiction, like science fiction is a genre of fiction. Design fiction is actually a form of design. It's a form of design that has an audience rather than users or consumers. So it's presented as if it were fiction, but it's actually at its best when it's close to the borders of reality, when you really can't tell the real from the imaginary, and when the practitioner is deliberately playing games with that. Diegetic is a word from the study of film and theater, and it refers to all the stuff outside the story proper that builds the world. The props, the set, the sounds. 
So design fiction can be done through invented objects, installations, designed experiences, videos, and yes, through writing. But design fiction actually tells worlds. It doesn't tell stories, and it doesn't tell people. You want to be in a situation with an object, and you kind of like look at the object, maybe hold it in your hand, and think, what kind of world would have a thing like this in it?、Mm-hmm. Right? It's not that. Oh, I feel sorry for Susan. <laughs> right, which is a kind of effect you would get from a magazine story, and it's like Susan came a cropper, you know, she tried to become a cyborg and it didn't work out, and it's a tragic story. So it's not about Susan, and it's not quite science fiction, and it's not quite design as we know it, but it's not completely separate either, as Sheldon himself describes design fiction. Even that term itself is a is a kind of interesting term to contemplate, you know, because it's kind of Got built、uh, built-in contradictions in it,、um, you know. Design as a,、uh, a a methodology of solving problems, fiction maybe as a methodology of exposing problems,、um, and and with that kind of contradiction, for me it starts to enter into the space of art making, and art making kind of adds another kind of dimension around problems, and art usually is about problem making or problematizing. And so you have these kind of different dynamics around the question of of the problem, and、uh, and so des- design fiction I think has this interesting、uh, carves out this interesting space between all of these places, and it might be the practice that has a particular necessity of of our particular moment, as we think that in 25 years we can't possibly imagine that future because it's going to be so extraordinarily different because our technologies develop so rapidly. But that's a question we always want to keep in mind. And this process of thinking about innovation, design, technical, social, and cultural development is a is a worthwhile thing to try to put together into a pot and see what kind of dish comes out the other side. It can be a little too theoretical unless you have some examples in mind. Later in this episode, we'll get into the details of the design fiction that Sheldon, Bruce, the writer and political activist Yasmina Tashanovic, and the Clark Center staff and students collaborated on last summer and fall. But let's look at a specific example through the work of Stuart Candy. Stuart Candy is probably the world's best-known practitioner of what's called experiential design fiction, which is where you. Make up an environment full of objects and services from the future, and just have people immerse themselves in it. In other words, you you build a room or a set, and you say, behind this door, it's 2025 A.D., and you're about to walk in there. Try not to be nervous. And then he hires actors, and he invents all these props, and he literally brings people into these experiences and has them go through it. It it can be remarkably effective. When you walk through one of these doors, you know it's sort of like costume play or these other kinds of、uh, science fiction convention activities where everybody's pretending to be a vampire. It's just better put together, right? And it can be like seriously disorienting because everybody's talking just as they normally do and kind of going about their their business, and it really feels like time travel. This is a project they did in Canada, which was called the 99 Cent Project, where They got a bunch of designers and students together to make very cheap, humble objects of the future—the kind of things you get out of a vending machine 20 or 30 years from now. And those are all these little plastic wrap things sitting on the table. Every one of those is some kind of design fiction intervention that these guys created.、And、then, when you're like sitting at the table and kind of going through these, is like visiting the 99 cent store, except everything is, yeah, everything has some kind of frisson to it. You know, it all it all has.、Uh, they're all diegetic prototypes, and they all suspend disbelief. There's a whole ecosystem of design fiction practitioners, people and groups like the Near Future Laboratory, Nelly Ben Hayoun, Alexandra Daisy Ginsberg, and the Next Nature Network, as well as programs in speculative design, including one of the first undergraduate degrees in it. Started right here at UC San Diego in 2015, but by now you might be asking, how as a designer is your approach to speculative design different than the standard operating procedure in terms of what you actually plan to make? Bruce, as a theorist, makes great charts, so he's got a chart for this one that, thanks to the magic of a purely auditory medium, 
I'll have to describe for you the best I can with some help from Bruce and some choice sounds. This is the anti-conventional objects diagram. You have to picture a three-circle Venn diagram. There's a region in the center where all three circles overlap and other places where a changeable two of the three share some territory. Each circle represents three requirements of a design object, that it be buildable, desirable, and profitable. Industrial design finds a harmony of these three things. We have smaller microprocessors and wireless technology, so at a certain point, a smartphone becomes buildable. And what it allows us to do, text and take photographs and Google and catch Pokemons, certainly makes it desirable. And thanks to a global supply chain that keeps costs relatively low and the Moore's Law-driven need to get a newer, faster, cooler one every 18 months, smartphones are certainly profitable. So there you go. Conventional object in your pocket. All right, okay, well, we happen to live in a capitalist society. So our conventional objects have to make money and somebody has to want them and we have to be able to make them. So they have to be desirable, buildable, and profitable. Monuments and space stations, in Bruce's chart, are buildable and desirable, but not profitable. Art and props are desirable and profitable, but not always buildable. Fake products and espionage gear are profitable and buildable, even if most of us find them very undesirable. Then there are the things that are only profitable. Fraud and vaporware, but also certain kinds of speculation. Or that are only buildable, but unwanted for love or money. Like obsolete technologies, pollution, and excess technical capacities. Then there's the class of things that are neither buildable nor profitable, but are highly desirable. The magical, the mythical, and the miraculous. But most objects don't fit in the conventional objects area. You know, most of them aren't real. They're imaginary or they're mythical or magical or whatever. So I just went out of my way to, like, show the haze of objects that are outside the world of conventional objects. And there's really lots. And not only that, but these circles move around quite a lot. So that stuff that used to be profitable no longer is. Or things that were not buildable become buildable. Or things that were desirable lose their cachet and people don't want them anymore. So the little brown area in the center is actually remarkably unstable. It tends to like fall apart. And the mere fact that it's real and kind of offered on a shelf at Walmart does not make it a permanent part of the universe. Then there's this other thing I wrote, which is rather similarly wordy, because I'm a writer. But this is the design fiction slider bar of disbelief. This takes the form of a numbered list. Starting from the bottom at point zero, there is the ideal truth of objects and services, which shows that we never really know the absolute and unobtainable objective truth about objects and services. I mean, we just don't. I mean, that's metaphysics. We, we can't absolutely know that, for instance, this water bottle is somehow better than this water bottle. I mean, we can't know its entire history and so forth. But, you know, we can write about it and we can kind of try to understand it. We can kind of come up to some kind of consensus about it. And then it gets slowly more hazy. These things get less and less. And then they sort of begin drifting off into a wonderland of fairy stories, magic, uh, vague religious notions. Like, everybody knows what the hammer of Thor is, but what are the industrial design specifications for the hammer of Thor? Right? And this is, like, actually, like, a problem. And when you become aware of, like, these shady areas, it's where you can do good design fiction interventions. You can begin to play these kinds of suspension of disbelief games where you make the implausible plausible and so forth. While they weren't tasked with a top-to-bottom redesign of Thor's hammer, Bruce and Sheldon were invited by the Vitra Design Museum to contribute a design fiction for their Hello Robot exhibition. And what they worked on was a speculative vision of domestic robots 25 years in the future. And that's part two of our episode, the designing of a design fiction with a team that includes a science fiction writer and design theorist, a visual and computational artist, and the Serbian feminist activist and writer Yasmina Tishanovic. 
But before you can design the future, we need a frame of reference that includes the past, as well as a very interesting project on the leading edge of the present in Torino, Italy. So first, I asked each of them where they were 25 years ago. 25 years ago, I was in the middle of war, I guess, you know, of ex-Yugoslavia and the falling apart of my country, you know. So if I look in 25 years ahead, uh, which is not mechanically what it should be, you know, what it was, as the future is saying, I hope it doesn't happen. But on the other hand, everything can happen looking backwards, you know. Now, 25 years ago, I guess that was the early 90s, which was, uh, you know, heyday of cyberpunk. Uh, what a fun time that was. I mean, I was roaming the world, writing for Wired magazine, doing all kinds of uh, stuff for a journalistic system that still existed at that time. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I was writing fiction, all kinds of stuff, really getting up people's nose. It was a lively period. For me, 25 years ago, I was uh, literally, I was in Chicago, and I was kind of venturing out into my... Uh, nascent career as an artist and academic teaching at the Art Institute of Chicago, which had, uh, I think, the, the, this country's first art and technology program. The amount of change that can occur in 25 years is kind of hard to conceptualize. 600 years ago, ways of life might not have changed all that much. But today, well, it's a different story, especially in terms of how technology interacts with culture. But if we just think about like this proposition of 25 years in the future, and we think about you know, where we've come in the last 25 years, uh, so what is that, 1991? Um, and uh, you know, what was different then than, than, than from our time now? Um, and what was un- unanticipated? You know, 25 years ago, we just had to be, you know, the internet was in a very nascent form. Um, it wasn't widespread, but, you know, or it wasn't, wasn't widely used, even though it was, you know, geographically widespread. Um, but things, the general ways we even use the Internet, like the World Wide Web, uh, was, was a kind of an, an, an emerging protocol at that time, and it wasn't even the dominant one. We, we, most people were using something called Gopher. And, uh, and, you know, how many people use Gopher today? Yeah. <laughs> Bruce connects it in a more personal way. I guess that was the early days of the net time list and, and uh, Spectrum and these uh, other kinds of lists, uh, which actually were the reason that Yasmina and I met some, some years later. Because we were both on these you know, electronic technology art mailing lists. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. It was also an, uh, an activist list, you know, it was where, where at, at the time the word blog didn't even exist when we were actually sharing our experiences from all over the world, you know, and it was a net time list and this is uh, the beginning of the heyday of, of, uh, of the so-called social media, you know. No, e- these were email lists, they were very writerly, they were super text-based and those were some extremely interesting discussions, especially after 1989 when you started seeing a lot of people from Eastern Europe suddenly show up on the internet. Um, that was, you know, really a, uh, a culturally explosive time. You know, reflecting on what Bruce and Yasmina are saying, you're, you know, we're just at the beginning stages of this thing that's going to become the Internet. Um, but it has it itself has all these other kind of antecedents from bulletin boards and and other kinds of ways in which uh, computers were used to not only kind of create visual experiences or sonic experiences or coordinate spatial experiences, but also develop new kinds of social environments. Um, so, so it's an interesting time 25 years ago because you're kind of on the cusp of the world really changing because of computation moving into uh, the ways in which we express and communicate um, globally. Thinking about history more generally, I asked Bruce how design fiction and other kinds of speculative design, along with things like the Maker's Movement, relate to past historical moments and movements. There's no decent futurist who's not a historian. So I'm I'm extremely interested in material culture. And I mean, that's why, you know, people in my movement were steampunks and cyberpunks. And we didn't really see any intellectual difference there. I mean, if you're trying to understand the cybernetic revolution, understanding an industrial revolution is kind of job one. You know, and you can recreate a lot of these things. But, you know, I, I, I would point out that the 
kind of social situation that allowed futurism or the arts and crafts movement to exist doesn't really exist in our own society. And But we do have kind of analogs to it, which are, you know, open source things or do-it-yourself things or collaborative things or instructables or, you know, kind of YouTube vernacular video experiments. There's a lot going on there that um, you can bend to your own effort. I mean, the thing that's different about us and like the arts and crafts movement is that the arts and crafts movement, there was a hell of a lot of money around. I mean, in the Belle Epoque, the situation was booming. And we're living in an era of like economic depression and terror war where, you know, Italy has like a 40 percent youth unemployment rate. And, you know, the country's been on the point of massive financial crisis ever since 2008. But since we're veterans of the Balkans, we don't find that depressing at all. On the contrary, it just kind of uh, never waste a good crisis. It's actually an opportunity to, um, you know, get people to take the process, the prospect of homemade plywood fur- furniture seriously. Today, Yasmina and Bruce are part of a project that looks to reinvigorate the home of the present. We have a, uh, a house project. Uh, which is a Turinese house of the future. It's the Arduino open source house of the future. Casa Yasmina, which is named after Yasmina Tishanovich here, um, which is, you know, a demonstration space for open source hardware and kind of home innovation projects uh, from an Italian perspective. So, you know, we actually have a place which is a home of the future, and I'm the curator of it. Bruce also happens to be Yasmina's husband, so the domestic dynamic isn't just theoretical or a fiction and goes as far as a slight disagreement over whether Casa Yasmina is a house of the future or of the present. Well, I think it's uh, the uh, house of the present, and it's the home of the present more than of the future. We are thinking in the terms of the future because we are thinking out of uh, the box and because we're thinking out of the after the economic crisis that hit after 2008 all the capitalists uh, and also the new block of the third world which is coming as a savior meaning new products new things new way of living no and uh, so Casa Yasmina is basically a place where we do live you know and we do experiment with all the stuff that we invent and people are living there too we have guests it's a it's a bed and breakfast space you know right now but it's also uh becoming a a museum space because people want to get there and exhibit their own things, you know, their own ideas because they believe in our idea. People know what open source software is. They know it's kind of like geeky and it doesn't work particularly well. Open source hardware may be a bigger deal in the long term. Uh, It's especially useful from like an Italian perspective of small to medium manufacturing craft enterprises where people do a lot of stuff. The maker scene in Italy is a big deal and, and different and in terms and like say Maker Faire San Diego here, which seems to be a big deal in San Diego. But you know, these, these movements, uh, uh, they hit populations at different angles. So we have this house which is full of open source hardware objects and we also have guys who are just designing furniture in the place. Everybody who drops by seems inspired to like make something and try to sit on it or cook on it or live with it or grow something out of it. So, you know, we've got like uh, our Arduino hot wired garden where everything's sort of automatically irrigated. We've got various, um, you know, prototypes. We've got some objects which are simply design fictions or they don't really work, but they're kind of interventions. Well, you, know, you really need prototypes in a sandbox. It's very difficult to say, I'm going to tear up my own daily routine and start over. But to have an area where a bunch of people are doing the same thing as that and kind of like this this kind of constant turnover of, of innovation or just failed experiments, that's actually very encouraging. At that point, you can say, well, I'm going to pick this one because this this really seems to have some legs. But somehow I, I see the Italians are the first one who will be able to make the connection between makers and, uh, and artists you know, with art in it. At a live event, Yasmina described in a little more detail how the casa came into being. In this space, which is uh, once used to be a big factory uh, constructed by uh, an architect, a famous architect uh, who made bridges in Italy, and and then afterwards it was a Fiat uh, warehouse, and then it was abandoned for 30 years, and it's really pretty and falling apart, you know. And I said, like, look, there is this space. Why don't we go there? It didn't have windows. You know, there were rats. 
there were pigeons, it was really cold, you know, but there was internet, you know, this is like really important. So we, Bruce and I, we, we, we slept on the floor, you know, and we tried to see, un po', uh, un po yeah, I'm speaking of Italian, <laughs> to see a little bit how the space works out for us. And we really loved it. Of course, there were trains, there were the pigeons, but we said, look, we can really give it a try. And so we started, we started working on it with these people, you know, starting from scratch without money, because you see, we also didn't want to uh, commit to um, big sponsors or any big companies, you know, because one of the things is about Internet of Things, about which I'm thinking all the time, it's already here, you know, and it's controlled by big companies, but the big famous five, you know. Instead, what we have to do, we as uh, citizens, as citizens who are using it, I don't like the word users, I don't want the word client, you know, I want to say that it's only people who live there, and we have to be smarter, and we don't have to be, you know, allow them to control us. They, along with Massimo Banzi, the co-founder of Arduino, began to work with young designers and technologists from the Torino Makers Movement. But and I realized all of a sudden that there were no women around, you know, like there were no children around. You know, I was sitting there with brilliant kids because they're half my age and they could be, you know, they come from Politecnico. And uh, and let's say that the Italian society is very male centered, you know, when it comes to technology. So I thought, like, you know, we should do something about that. You know, first of all, we should. I must speak to these women. I must find where are the women and speak to them if they're not present, you know. There must be some reason for that. And actually, I came up with seven, seven ways of Internet of Women Things, which are different. In her manifesto on the Internet of Women Things, Yasmina describes these seven principles. So first one is critical design, you know, uh, through technologies I mentioned. The second one is positive inclusion, because really, I mean, a great percentage, I mean, in Italy, it's like 5% of women are there, so they want to have just physically women there. And then positive seclusion, uh, that women... Uh, that's uh, three. Well, that's three. That when they live alone, they want to, uh, they work alone, they think in a different way. Privacy control, they don't want that's to be four. connected. And then there is the fifth one, which says, just do it. We don't want to be mentioned at all as women, as gender. You know, I mean, uh, exclusion from the gender. Uh, and then there is design fiction. Uh, girls like a lot to do design fiction stories about objects, stories. They like the stories. And then the cultural differences. They notice that the thing that works in Italy that, would that work in Germany, seven. would work in the U.S. Okay, that's it. Because of Yasmina's thinking, the design goals of Casa Yasmina are oriented a little bit differently. Not the most successful, not the most smart, not the most intelligent, not the prettiest will have success, but something that people accept in their everyday lives. Meaning, you, not user, not clients, but people like children, old people, who are really in need of technology, of this new way of communicating with soft robots, or, but they don't want intruders. They don't want something to intrude on them. You know, this is very important. It, Italy is a country of design, and it has this really want and really need an obsessive need of beauty, you know, which I appreciate. You know, on the other hand, if you combine it with open source, it means that we can share this, uh, let's say, uh, let's say personal or personalized design. So you don't go to IKEA and buy stuff, you know, which everybody has, but you can open source it and you can design it and you can redesign it. So I think that in that sense, Italy is the best country for that. Bruce gave a good example of how this works out. Okay, we have a children's room in Casa. Yasmina that has no actual children. But it's been there from the beginning. And whenever I'm the curator of Casa Yasmina, and often people bring me these things that are, you know, elaborate and fancy and would kill a small child. And I'm like, okay, we can't have that here because it would hurt the kids. You know, and, and people take that as a as a rebuff, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, you're right. I'll have to take it back to the lab. You know, I can't have it in a real house because you know it would hurt the kids. Okay, there are no kids. I mean, kids show up to see the room, but nobody's actually ever, no child has ever lived in the space. But they have their own room, they have their own little bed, they have their own, like, kid stuff up on the wall. People come through it, they oh, well, this is the kid's room. And I was like, there's a family living here. Okay, that sets design constraints on the objects that can be in there. I can't have a laser cutter in the kitchen. I can't have a power saw or a power drill in the living room, even though there's one not 50 meters away. You know, because we've got a full-scale fab lab happening, you know, 
You can hear them drilling stuff in there, but just no drills here. Why? The imaginary kids wouldn't put up with it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and, and then when you walk into the house, people relax because they realize it is a domestic space. It just has the look and feel of one. And you don't have to talk to them about it. You don't have to convince them. Oh, well, this is a house. Because everything in it is kid safe mm-hmm. and kind of considered, mm-hmm. they just like they shed like a, you know, like a uh, a grown up shell when they come through the door, and people actually start talking differently to one another. It's like, do you have a coffee? You know, they're leafing through a magazine. Background music's playing. You know, people are having snacks on the couch. They're watching TV in Casa Yasmina. And you don't have to harangue them. You don't have to lecture them. It's all done with the um, the semiotics, really, of the chosen objects in the space. What from and, the- and even though some of the people there are imaginary, they still have a real effect. But the, the good side is that people from the neighborhood, because it was kind of an abandoned neighborhood, you know, even though it was very pretty once, and it is in downtown. It's like parts of L.A., which are completely in downtown and abandoned. Now, these people are so happy, and they come with their children, and they come to the Maker's Fair, and they enter Casa and Smina. And I remember once Bruce and I were, like, going to bed, you know, and all of a sudden, you have them entering our bedroom and say, <laughs> can we see, please, you know, how is your bed made, you know, is it? And we're, like, sitting there, you know, like, behaving like John and Yoko, you know, like, you know, life is art, you know, never mind, we you know. We have many John and Yoko <laughs> moments. Yeah, yeah, we had, you know, you just... Uh, you know. Okay, now we've got a sense of the past. We have some insights from working on a home of the present that at least is very highly oriented toward the future. And we have a better ability to think about the design fiction task that Bruce and Yasmina were in residence at the Clark Center to incubate. A video installation conceived of and created with Sheldon, along with artists, staff, and students here at the Clark Center, called My Elegant Robot Freedom. I spoke with the three of them about two-thirds of the way into the creation of the piece, starting with the early conceptual approach. I mean, we were in communication about this for a few months. Um, we, We started talking about this at a at a Clark Center event in Washington, D.C. that we do with the Smithsonian called The Future is Here. And, uh, and Bruce kind of very slyly just said, I've got something. Maybe we can work on it together. Are you interested? And I'm like, okay, tell me more. So he kind of like, you know, he has a sly way of kind of reeling you into his kind of schemes, I think. And uh, and so this this started to get, get going and we started to uh, communicate and set up this blog about the kind of uh, some of the background material. But what was interesting I found when uh, when we started working on this here was that what this position and experience they've had with Casa Yasmina kind of situates us uh, in a way for our kind of uh, a starting condition, I think. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that starting condition Bruce mentioned a moment ago was like what what might the kind of uh, capabilities of 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 the future kind of mean to a, a, a social condition, a social and cultural condition that would exist in in Central Europe. And so, if we were doing this house of the future in New York City or in Shanghai, you know, or in Mexico City uh, or San Diego. It wouldn't be the same project that we're doing that's uh, in the way that we've kind of constructed the backstory and what it means to the people involved in it and the kind of material capabilities of the, of the, of the time and place of 25 years from now in, in Germany. Well, you know, if you're going to do design fiction objects or kind of di- diegetic prototypes, you have to have an audience for them because otherwise you're just like – daydreaming at home, right? And so we have an audience. We have a patron. I mean, we actually have Vitra Design Museum who, like, was kind enough to motivate us to do this stuff. So you need to have a set of ideas that you want to dramatize. You need to have some, um, you know, some method of, uh, of understanding what the public itself wants to see. And then you have to set some limits on what you yourself can physically make, right? I mean, things have to make sense, they have to look good, and they have to be buildable. So, you know, we spent a lot of time on the ideas, months, really, just sort of throwing spaghetti at the wall. We came here, we spent about a week 
doing, you know, scenario work and inventing personas and kind of deciding which ideas were good and which were the other. And then we spent, you know, a week and a little bit more literally just assembling prototypes out of all kinds of abject materials, trash bags, bits of string, foam core. Lots of balloons. Lots of balloons, <laughs> tons of balloons, latex, you know, uh, weird paper overalls. I mean, just, you know, the, the kind of, you know, design school rubbish you can hack up with an X-Acto knife. And as Bruce is saying, you know, we we went through and kind of like we came up with um, underlying technology that would – inhabit all of these things and kind of went through the trouble of kind of like really describing and defining and debating, you know, well, is that going to work? How in the hell will that work? And it's like, well, in the one hand, we could say, oh, of course, it'll just work. We're making it up. But on the other hand, the more kind of rigorous we are at kind of thinking it through, the more it gives us the kind of limitations and parameters of on our imagination so that the thing has edges and you feel the tension against those edges. That's right. I mean, you, you need the grain of the material because if everything is possible, nothing is interesting. Specifically, they were looking at what kind of domestic robots might be in use 25 years from today. Well, I'd say the object we worked hardest on was the, an object we called the Zimmer, Zimmer Gremlin. Uh, but we were very interested in, in, in robots with sort of soft exteriors. Like robots that are made basically of gelatin or nanocarbon that don't have any metal or any moving parts. So we wanted to do, we wanted to imagine a future where there were whole sets of soft robots, some very large, some very small, kind of on all, on all urban scales. So we thought, let's make a small one, right? Just kind of a thing like a dust mop that's basically a soft Roomba. Because right. Roombas exist and they're domestic robots that are in the present day. So you can imagine if somebody was a soft robotic guy, he'd be like, oh, I'm going to like do a gelatinous Roomba a thing that just kind of rolls across the floor like a terry cloth mop, picks up all the dirt, then goes back into the sink, washes itself off and hides in the corner like a Roomba does. So we spent, we spent quite some time trying to uh, come up with a scheme where we could video moving objects that would behave as if they were autonomous, soft Roombas. But I think there was something about just working through how materials function and then in relationship to kind of this, these kind of conceptual notions we had about what we will be able to do when we're able to address and manipulate these materials in a you know, couple orders of magnitude beyond what we're doing today – uh, kind of informed what what these things actually could do that took us into some, I think, stranger, but in a way more plausible uh, possibilities of what these kind of future scenarios might be. You know, so you start to play with, you know, these uh, <clears throat> nested, basically nested water balloons in soap solutions and roll them down inclined planes and look at the kind of physics of what that motion is and kind of start to think about, you know, and here's like a, here's, here's like how material properties actually function when they have a certain kind of material quality. And then that informs then what we end up kind of trying to do in the video. Yeah. You know, if you had said, here's like a bag full of balloons, now write a story about it. I don't think anything would have happened. <laughs> but, you know, when you actually have an idea and you're like, well, let's just try the simplest possible loose solution and, like, go out and get 10 cents worth of balloons and have at it, you know, it just, like, um, you know, it just puts you into a design space because you actually are tackling the grain of the material instead of trying to come up with the most dramatic kind of thing to say about it. You're actually just, you know, there with the object in the situation. Okay, you know, it's not perfect, but it's... It's going to do. I mean, it's what Brian Eno used to say. I mean, he does a lot of oblique strategy style things where he, he just sort of messes about with music. He says, like, I get the good result and then I paint the target around that. Now with some targets after all this initial experimentation, the next question was, how should we organize this collection of stuff so it, so it kind of starts, so meaning starts to emerge out of it? And then, and then uh, this, this kind of quadrant uh, and these axes... Uh, just became a way to to kind of 
put some clarity and dimension into we what was otherwise many, just yeah. a flat list of, st- of we things. We had too many stories, remember? Oh, you've got, way, you've got way too many stories. I mean, you, and, and they need to be kind of moved into situations. I mean, you know, I, I do a lot of futurist quadrant work, and, and it's silly to think that the future has only four varieties. But, you know, three is too few, oddly enough, and five is too many. <laughs> And I've, I've seen it done many times. And, you know, it works best actually with large groups of people because if you're teaching futurism or, or if you're doing some futurist consulting and you've got 20 or 30 people in the room, um, they usually know a lot more about the future than they are able to sort of blatantly say. So you need to set up a kind of sandbox for them where they can put on a mask and then use that to tell the truth. So if you put up, bring up four quadrants, which are four different versions of a future world, and then you divide groups up into four competing teams and tell them, I want you to make your world the most convincing, right? It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be better than the other three. People will achieve just marvels of imagination. They'll just really take it and go with it. And it's very good for resolving multidisciplinary problems like I'm an engineer, she's a lawyer, he's an actress. What do we have to talk about? Well, you have to talk about this particular situation, right, as opposed to like this one, that one, and the other. And, you know, at that point, they and a team spirit immediately arouses and they sort of They'll name themselves and they'll like come up with all kinds of rah rah situations. So, you know, these quadrants have to capture the imagination uh, and they have to illuminate a situation, but mostly they just help you clarify your thinking so you don't get overwhelmed by a hundred things. If you say, I've got four sandboxes and this one has all the red ones, this one has all the blue ones, this one has all the green ones, and this other one has like all the weird leftover stuff. That's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And almost always in quadrant work, the one that has all the weird leftover stuff is the one that you'll learn real lessons from. But it's also like the difference between a script and a movie, you know. I mean, when you do a script, it's just an indication of what will happen then when you have the movie at the end as a product, you know. It's like because it all depends on how the actor can pronounce something on, you know, what will come up. Like many surprises that came out here were just some kind of mistakes, you know, or something you don't even predict. And then you see, oh, that's it. You know, this has worked better, you know. So, I mean, the quadrant is just something where, you, as he said, Bruce said, you too, Harold, that they opened the imagination, you know, like, but then what really comes up is, is like uh, the distillation of it. It's amazing when you have the product at the end, how you say, oh, it couldn't have been, in a different way. That's it. <laughs> and you know when it's it. And you know when it's yeah. not it. This is, for me, it's always interesting how, like when l- looking at the material we had this morning and when we shot, it looks uh, not only better than I expected because I was more confused three days ago, you know, but it also looks very clear, you know, right. as to what uh, we wanted to say, you know. Yeah, the whole process has been incredibly iterative and, and very emergent in terms mm-hmm. of where where we're going with it. And you know, I, we, I mean, we come into it with, you know, a certain kind of uh, idea space that we're trying to work towards. And, uh, but it's been a very open process where, you know, it's like we've, what we're going to end up is something that's truly going to have only come out of the process that we've engaged in over the last few weeks and over the next few weeks as we try to pull these things together. And it's not going to be anything that we, in its specifics, that we ever would have had preconceptions about. Uh, but as you say, in the end, it'll be like, yes, of course, that's what it is. The you know? tentacle, for example. We didn't mention the tentacle. And I, and I must say, that, you know, along with Sheldon's great help, it was, it was very useful and interesting to see these people in the orbit of the Clark Center drop by and kind of contribute stuff. I mean, the robot tentacle that we have is the star of the show, you know, the... the uh, the, the computer CGI simulations of the blobs are super interesting. Uh, even the six-year-old kid who showed up was kind of a really good child actor. <laughs> the 18-year-old had plenty to offer. You know, the, the film director people who came by were like, you know, selflessly helping us with stuff. And, and even my colleague Pepe Rojo from the University of Tijuana, who may be the... the the most advanced ciencia ficción writer working in Mexico now was kind enough to come to San Diego and and and, and uh, you know uh, play a walk on part in our in our trials here. So it was great to have the opportunity to see Pepe. 
And, you know, also, I, I just I have to give some credit to, like, the San Diego community generally. I mean, I'd never been to UCSD. I didn't really know much about your school. But having done a public appearance here and talked to a few people, I can see why you have the international reputation that you do. There's a heck of a lot going on. I, I see that the School of Visual Arts here at UCSD has a speculative design major now. And, you know, I think it's helpful to do things like this to sort of suggest what a speculative design major might do after he graduates. <laughs> like, what are you going to do with this? And, uh, you know, I, I have found design fiction to be a, a kind of super interesting thing to write about. I don't do all that much of it myself. This is kind of a rare example of me really going in there and getting right up against the coal face and like trying to build props and really, you know, working on stuff. And, um, you know, I feel I benefited by it. It's like I've gotten a bit of an education here. You know, if I do this again, I'll do it in some bolder way and you know, I'll like try new things. And we're, you know, we're slowly we're forming a, a network of interested parties who are going to, you know, grow more and more aware of one another. Uh you know, you always wonder what to do with works of design fiction. Design museums are very often the patrons for this. You know, I mean, sometimes, sometimes corporations will do it. I mean, there are many houses of the future. There's a Google House of the Future, right? As as Dunn and Raby say in their masterpiece work, you know, speculative everything. You need a kind of general general speculative approach to like get this stuff to work. And, uh, you know, I find that's great. I mean, I, I haven't surrendered my love for science fiction, but the ability that design fiction gives me to involve myself with other disciplines and just people in other walks of life uh, refreshes my work quite a lot. We hope this dive into design fiction has left you feeling refreshed, too. If you happen to be in Central Europe, the project we've been talking about is at the Vitra Design Museum until May 14th, before the Hello Robot exhibition begins its circumnavigation of museums around the world. We'd like to thank Bruce Sterling and Yasmina Tasanovich. Bruce's latest work of science fiction is Pirate Utopia. Yasmina's books include Diary of a Political Idiot, and her recent writing can be found on Boing Boing and other online hotspots. Into the Impossible is a podcast of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination at UC San Diego. Our work would be impossible without the support of our generous patrons and sponsors, including Viasat Inc., members of the Founders Orbit, and the James B. Axe Family Foundation. To find out more about the Clark Center and our other exciting projects, research, and programs, please visit imagination.ucsd.edu. Audio production is by Wes Hawkins and Patrick Coleman, produced by Patrick Coleman and Sheldon Brown. And thanks to everybody for the feedback and for sharing the podcast with your friends. If you're on iTunes, please leave a review. It really helps and we appreciate it. And thanks for listening. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three.